football is football. Whether it's in the Mountain West, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, or in high school, football is football, and what wins now is what's always won. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. Today is Thursday, August 4th. We appreciate you being with us, and we hope that you're enjoying the content so far, wherever it is you're getting it, whether that's on ESPN YouTube's channel, the Apple Podcast, or... If it's on Spotify, we appreciate you being with us. Please like, rate, and subscribe. It helps the show. It helps us out. Hit us up in the comments. We're trying to get better. So any type of constructive criticism you can provide, that will be beneficial to us moving forward. I'm Greg McElroy. Along with me, as always, is Mark Kubiak. Just want to take a quick moment. I know we don't do other sports here, but I'm a diehard Dodger fan. My middle name is Vincent. My son's name is Vince. Part of the reason why is because I idolize Vince Scully. So I just want to take a quick moment to just recognize and tip our cap to a guy that meant so much to me. He's the voice, uh, the soundtrack of my childhood and, and a voice I went to bed listening to just about every morning of my young adolescent life. So thank you, Vin, for all that you did. Thank you for all that you meant and appreciate all the many memories you've provided us as sports fans over the years. Look, we have a great game plan in store for you today. We're going to play a new game. It's called Give Me Hope. Those of you fan bases that have been trying to figure out exactly where you're going to be this year. Well, we're going to give you some silver lining. We're going to give you some optimism. So we're going to dive into a couple teams and tell you why we think this year actually might be better than some might suggest. And we're also going to dive into the bill that's likely to hit the floor here in the near future. We're not going to go deep into the weeds because we don't do politics. We're not really that into NIL. But we do want to update you with what's going on and what could potentially come down here in the weeks and months to come as far as NIL legislation is confirmed. But like we do every day, let's talk about some ball. So let's talk about it. All right, let's talk about it. Look, some of these programs that we're about to discuss have fallen on hard times. There have been upheaval. There's been turnover. It's been challenging. The new world has just shaken up the ground beneath their feet. But the good news is, There's always next year. And that's why I think we're going to take these programs. We're going to give you three reasons why you should feel good about what they have coming back in 2022. So, Coops, without much further ado, let's get into Give Me Hope. All right, Greg. I'm in Lubbock, Texas. I'm a Red Raider fan. We've had four head coaches in the last five years, including an interim coach. Give me hope things are going to get better, please. All right, first of all, Reckham from the South Lake Carroll Dragon here. All right, we'll start there. Second of all, all right, as we move into it, I told you I'm going to give you three reasons why I feel pretty good about what Texas Tech might be this year. Number one is coaching. Wow, going out on a limb there, Greg, aren't you? Well, you look at it, Joey McGuire, there's very few people that are more entrenched to the Texas High School Coaches Association than Joey McGuire. He has endeared himself to high school coaches all throughout the Lone Star State. And he feels like, to me, the guy that's most connected to the state of Texas since Sonny Dykes. Excuse me, Spike Dykes. Sonny Dykes, too, I guess. (laughs) More on TCU a little bit later. But when you think about what Sonny Dykes was, look, I know Cliff Kingsbury is there. I know he played at Texas Tech. I get that. But did he ever feel like a guy that could connect with the Texas High School Coaches Association? No. Recruited great. Did a good job of putting forth pretty impressive offenses, recruiting quarterback talent. But Joey McGuire, I think, will wave the magic wand and be able to make Texas Tech a destination yet again. Him, along with their new offensive coordinator, Zach Kitley, who, by all accounts, is the new renegade future head coach that we're going to see in the very near future. The guy is an offensive mastermind. You look at what he did at Houston Baptist a couple years back. You look at what he did last year at Western Kentucky. He turned Bailey Zappi, a guy that was under-recruited, guy that was unbelievably productive, turned him into one of the greatest, well, performed one of the greatest seasons we've ever seen by a quarterback, regardless of level, last year at WKU. He's now at Texas Tech, and he's got some decent personnel to work with. Reason number two, personnel. You're saying coaching and personnel. Wow. Imagine that. He must feel good if they like the coaching, he likes the personnel. Fair enough. Uh, But I think you have a quarterback in Tyler Shuck that is really gifted. I remember a couple years ago, I'm calling an Oregon game. I'm sitting there, I'm watching Justin Herbert. I'm like, man, this guy can throw it. And then I'm watching the backup. I'm like, 
this guy's pretty good too. <laughs> now, Tyler Shuck, you know, a little bit banged up last year. If he can stay healthy, I think he could be one of the more talented quarterbacks that Texas Tech's had in a few years. So I'm very excited about what he might be if, in fact, he locks down the job. No, he's still in the competition, but I feel good about his upside, and I think he'll get the first crack at it based on what he has from a skill set and a measurable standpoint. That and defensive line. If you have a quarterback and you have defensive line in college football, you got to feel pretty good about it. Well, yeah, they lost some quality pieces at the second level defensively, but when you look at what they have coming back, they have some war daddies up front, including Tyree Wilson. Everyone needs to know this name. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to be the second coming of Von Miller. I, I'm not going to go that far, but I really believe that this guy can be a complete difference maker as the end man of the line of scrimmage for this defense. Him, coupled with the fact that you got Jalen Hutchings back, you got Merriweather back, you could blossom into arguably one of the better defensive lines in the Big 12 if all those pieces can stay healthy. That should take some of the pressure off the second level where you obviously lost a lot of production. And then finally, the way they finished last year. Look, I don't care what you say. You have a statement win over your former head coach in a bowl game. I know people say bowl games don't matter. Think about the momentum that that can create. That creates a ton of momentum heading into the offseason, and you know the buy-in collectively will be much, much higher for that of Joey McGuire than it would be for just about any other coach. So I am bullish on Texas Tech this year in what I think is a very deep Big 12. Let's look at the Vegas over-under. Of course, Vegas knows better than anybody for the most part. They have it at five and a half. Here's the bad news. I think there's only one guaranteed win on this schedule. That's against Murray State in week one. Brutal non-conference. You go at NC State in week three. And I think you have the toughest group of five team in America coming to your place on September 10th, that being Houston. Now, it's a winnable game. It can be done, but tough, tough sledding against a team that won 11 games last year. So a tough non-conference schedule. And then I already referenced it. The Big 12 is an absolute gauntlet. I think everyone can beat everyone. That includes Kansas. That's why I'm not giving them Kansas, even though I think they'll win that game. I feel really good about them winning that game, but Kansas should be improved in year number two under Lance Leipold. So you look at it. What are the guaranteed wins? I think for Texas Tech, you got to protect the home field. You get West Virginia at home. That's a winnable game. You get Baylor at home. That's a winnable game. You get Texas at home. That's a winnable game, even though I think all three of those aforementioned teams are going to be rock solid. You maybe steal one or two on the road. Maybe Iowa State has a down year after they lost so much. You catch them second to last week of the season. Maybe you surprise Oklahoma, who's licking their wounds a little bit after bed Bedlam, which is the week before. Who knows exactly what it's going to work out. But I think Texas Tech, the reason why I'm most optimistic, that even though it might not happen here in 2022, it will happen in the future because of who their head coach is and how he will endear himself to everyone in the Lone Star State and make sure the kids are considering the Red Raiders yet again. All right, we're going down to the Plains. And as an Auburn fan, I can't believe I have to ask an Alabama quarterback to give me hope. But the last nine months have been just brutal for me. So please, as an Auburn fan, give me hope. Reason number one why I feel good about Auburn, you have an alignment in the coaching staff. From head coach to coordinator, it felt like last year with Mike Bobo on offense and Derek Mason on defense. While both did a pretty decent job, Derek Mason more so than Mike Bobo, it felt like they were kind of pulling in different directions. Looked like there were some philosophical differences, and that's a big reason why I think both guys decided to look elsewhere when it came to their job opportunities this year. Well, insert Eric Keesaw on offense, insert Jeff Schmetting on defense. Those guys know exactly what Brian Harson wants it to look like. Now, I think Brian Harson came to the SEC an outsider, and people are sitting there thinking, well, you, you got to have some guys on the staff that know this league. Okay, fine. Sure. But football is football. Whether it's in the Mountain West, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, or in high school, football is football. And what wins now is what's always won. Great play along the line of scrimmage, great quarterback play, stout defense, blocking, tackling, fundamentals, you name it. And the Boise teams that Brian Harson's coached in the past, who, by the way, Eric Keesaw knows all about, Jeff Schmetting knows all about, those teams do the little things right all the time. And that's what I think is going to happen on the Plains this year. I think there were definitely some issues last year, and they really weren't that far away as well. That's reason number two, because last year wasn't that bad. I know Auburn fans will look at it and say, well, six and seven. It's not what we're looking for. But when you think about it, you lose your starting quarterback. 
Any team that loses their starting quarterback is going to struggle. Yeah, are there rare examples like Ohio State back in 2014 where they lost not one but two starting quarterbacks and still ended up winning the championship? Sure, there are examples of that. But more often than not, you look at any team that suffers an injury to their starter, their three-year starter, by the way, in Bo Nix, it's going to be a difficult sled to push. They lost their last three games by a combined 10 points. That includes a game against Alabama, and they had Alabama on the ropes, if not for an amazing drive led by Bryce Young to tie the game and send it to overtime. And they had that game on their racket. They couldn't pull it off. So yeah, well, you got to be disappointed if you're an Auburn fan. I'm not going to say, well, there, there are no moral victories if you're an Auburn Tiger. I get that. But it really wasn't as bad as some people like to suggest. And then finally, they have arguably the best one-two running back punch in the SEC. You can make an argument on behalf of Jarquez Hunter and of course, Tank Bigsby. And with what they're going to do now with Eric Keesaw as their offensive coordinator, expect a lot of stretch zone, expect a lot of perimeter runs, expect a lot of one cut runs, which is exactly what Tank Bigsby does really well. That coupled with the fact that you're probably going to have a pretty solid quarterback. I think it's going to be Zach Calzada. If it's not Zach Calzada, it's more experienced TJ Finley, who looked like a deer in headlights at times down the stretch last year. I think their schedule is actually pretty favorable as well. So alignment the coaching staff, Last year wasn't as bad as you'd think. And the one-two punch at running back can go with anybody. But when I look at this team, the reason why I'm most optimistic is the schedule. I'm not saying it's easy. You still have Alabama. You still have Georgia. You still have tough games, obviously. It's the SEC, specifically the SEC West. But what has Auburn always done well? They play well with momentum. 2010, you look at how they played in September. They got going. They got going. They got going. Next thing you know, they're beasts come November. And they end up winning the national championship. You look at 2013, all right? Start out playing pretty good. And boom, you have a play against Georgia. Boom, you have the kick six. Boom, you win the SEC. Boom, you have the game on your racket yet again against Florida State. And Jameis Winston leads a miraculous touchdown drive. This has always been a momentum team. When they play well early, that tends to carry over into the following week and the following week and the following month, and then ultimately into the postseason. I'm not saying that Auburn's going to win the national championship or are they going to win the SEC, but I like the way their set schedule sets up. You get two winnable games, very winnable games, the first two games of the season. You got Mercer and San Jose State. You should win those games very comfortably. We're not going to spend any more time on that. Penn State is week three. You went up to their place last year and you had plenty of opportunities to make that game more competitive. You ended up losing the game. You had a couple bad decisions. I think you had a bad errant throw there at the end that could have tied it, could have made it interesting. It didn't go your way. It happens. But now you have Penn State coming to your place. And anyone that's ever been to Jordan-Hare knows that that is a place of nightmares. It's tough to go in there. It's going to be hot. It's going to be rowdy. And if Auburn's sitting there at 2-0, you know they'll be very excited to welcome the Nittany Lions to their neck of the woods. You win that game, which you'll probably be favored in. You have Missouri coming up the following week. I think you're going to be a heavy favorite against Missouri. That's 4-0. and And then you welcome LSU into town. You could very easily find yourself at 5-0 and before you start getting into the meat of your schedule. Well, if your Vegas win total is only six, tell me you can't get a split between the last six games? I think it's very reasonable. Right now, you're probably going to lose at Georgia. Alabama on the road is going to be a really tough game. But you beat Arkansas comfortably last year. They come to you. You hung with a and at least for a half, but you couldn't score any points. There in the second half of the game, you lost the game convincingly because you just couldn't manufacture points. Well, you get them at your place now. Maybe you can make something happen. Then you got Western Kentucky there as the kind of warm-up game for the Iron Bowl. So I think that this team very much is going to go over their win total. And I think when you're backed into a corner two, like Auburn has been, they're going to come together and they're going to be dangerous, especially the way that season starts out. All right, going from the Plains out to the farm. I'm a Cardinal fan. <laughs> I've seen my coach take us to Orange Bowls and Fiesta Bowls and Rose Bowls. We've been in the conversation for national championships. And then in the last three years, we've won a total of 11 games. Greg, please give me hope. <laughs> this one's a little tougher. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, well, Pac-12 North's gettable. I guess we got that going for us. But here's the three reasons why I think Stanford's got a chance to take a step forward this year. One, Tanner McKee. Uh, the guy's got NFL talent, started red hot last year, came out of the gates, 11 touchdowns against zero interceptions, but really hit a wall there the, down the stretch. They just didn't play very well, didn't execute very well, and didn't have a great supporting cast. 
So I think that was troublesome. But this year, I think knowing that they're going to have struggles along the offensive line, perhaps, and they probably are going to struggle running the football, hopefully they've definitely kind of adapted their offense to suit their best player. And that's Tanner McKee, their quarterback. Number two, they have a ton of experience. Look, they bring back 10 starters on offense, and every player that will likely see extended playing time is either a junior or senior. Everybody is a veteran on this roster. Now, that might, might not always be a good thing because while experience is great, I'd rather have talent, and they are kind of lacking as far as talent is concerned relative to what they've been in the past. But either way, they're too deep on offense. Features 20 out of 22 players are either juniors and seniors. It's a pretty good starting point. And then three... They've adjusted their defense. They looked internally and they said, look, we have been playing a certain way with three down defensive linemen for a very long time. We don't have the bodies to do that right now. So they have now adjusted from a three down defensive line to a four down defensive line. And you got to think that they're a little smaller, might be a little bit more athletic, might cause a little disruption, might get pushed around a little bit too, but you also might create more negative plays defensively by moving and shifting and using that athleticism and being undersized, you almost have no choice. You can't just line up and take on blocks. It is what it is. So you move, you adjust, and maybe you can cause some confusion for the opposing offense and create some more negative plays to get offenses off schedule. Because if you got teams that are off schedule and playing behind the sticks, you have a legitimate chance. So credit to Lance Anderson, the defensive coordinator. He acknowledged, look, we can't do it the way we've always done it. We got to adjust. We got to adapt. And we got to fit the defense to our personnel. And it feels like they've done that this year. Vegas does not have high hopes for the Stanford Cardinal. Has it at four and a half this year. You look at their setup. They should beat Colgate, obviously, in week number one. SC comes to town in week two. Obviously, that's going to be a big game. ABC Prime. (laughs) So when Lincoln Riley comes to town, first really big spotlight for Lincoln Riley. You got to think he's going to have a couple bells and whistles up his sleeve to make sure that SC sends a message there with millions upon millions of people watching from around the country. You go to Washington, Washington should be better. Probably not going to be a very winnable game. Go to Oregon the following week, probably not going to be a winnable game. Oregon State has to replace a few pieces. I liked the Beavs last year, really liked what they were. Really down the stretch, that offensive line, they were tough, they were physical, they could run the football, but it's a winnable game. It's a game that Stanford can win. Not sure they will, but it's definitely a game they can win. I think at Cal's a winnable game. Uh, I think Washington State at home, depending on what they're going to get from their quarterback, Cameron Ward, maybe that's a winnable game. Arizona State, they should be really bad this year, relatively speaking. So that's a winnable game. So you look at it, they could get to five or six. Just got to pull off a couple upsets, which Stanford's done in the past. I don't think anyone would be surprised if Stanford went out and pulled off a couple upsets. But they're going to need to be better along both lines of scrimmage. They got to be better defensively and they have to do a better job of protecting their quarterback. But hey, with experience, maybe they'll take that stride this year. Okay, thank you. This one's going to be a big one because I'm a national championship fan. We've won it in 93, 99, 2013. We are not supposed to fall off. As Seminoles, as Florida State fans, we were never supposed to be down. We're in the hotbed of recruiting. Greg, please, please give me hope things are going to get better for Florida State. I actually think they are going to get quite a bit better this year. They've been close. They've been very, very close. Of course, last year, if not for a Hail Mary against Jacksonville State, they would have been in the postseason. Uh, Of course, they didn't play great against Florida. That would have put them in the postseason. But they showed the ability to turn things around after an 0-4 start. That showed me a lot of heart. All right. The reason why I feel good about him, though, Jordan Travis. All right, he's not looking over his shoulder anymore, and he's coming into this year having won five of his last seven games as a starter. It's a pretty good spot. Now, we know that he's got great athleticism, always has. But now, if he can take the next step as a passer, there's reason to believe, especially with the supporting cast. We'll get to them in a minute. The supporting cast that he has on the outside, man, they are really solid at wide receiver. Should be better, hopefully. We know the big reason why this offense has struggled in the last handful of seasons because the offensive line has been extremely inconsistent. Well, hopefully that group will come together a little bit more this year because the problems have really been on offense, but there's reason to believe that the offense could take a significant step forward. I think they could run the football. That should take some of the pressure off Jordan Travis. And when they does get the opportunity to throw it because of the threat of the run game, he's probably going to have one-on-ones. And now he has guys that can win those one-on-ones on a regular basis. Reason number two, the transfer portal. They added four power five transfers in the portal at wide receiver alone, including Micah Pittman out of Oregon who might be their go-to guy by the time the season rolls around. And then Winston Wright 
from West Virginia. So those are two difference-making wide receivers that Jordan Travis is going to have on the outside to rely on. And I, th I think, like I said, I think they're going to be able to run the football. It's going to take some of the pressure off. So those guys get one-on-ones, man, strike up the fight song. Let's rock and roll. Defensively, they also added a couple pieces. We know they lost Keir Thomas. We know they lost Jermaine Johnson. Two pieces that will be very difficult to replace, especially when it comes to the pass rush presence that they had on the end of the line of scrimmage. But you go to the FCS and you add Jared Verse from Albany. Can he play at this level? I don't know. But all I know is based on the tape that I saw last year, guy had 10 sacks, nearly 10 sacks playing for Albany, and it's a pretty good place to start. Him coupled with Tatum Bethune, who's coming over from UCF, who should lock down or at least compete to lock down one of those inside linebacker spots. The middle of the defense should be very, very solid. Yet again, now you might have an edge presence if Verse can come on and repeat some of the productivity he did last year at the FCS level. And then finally, the biggest reason why I'm most optimistic about Florida State, look at what they did down the stretch defensively. Look, look at 2020, look at the first four games of 2021, then look at the last eight games. The final two months of the season, this was a different looking group defensively. I mean, they moved a couple pieces around in the secondary, locked that those positions down. All those guys are back. You look at the second level, they will miss those guys. They're going to miss, like I said, Keir Thomas and Jermaine Johnson. They're going to miss those guys for sure. But if I want to be good on defense, I really want to be good from the inside out. Well, on the inside, Fabian Lovett, Robert Cooper, pretty good place to start. So I think this defense continues to build on what they did last year. And if they can do that and the offense comes along, say 10, 15%, 20% better, a couple of those toss-up games are going to be flipped. They had a couple teams on the ropes last year. Clemson game was close. Florida game was close. Shouldn't Should have won the Jacksonville State game. Notre Dame game was close in week one. This team was a lot closer than I think some people like to suggest. And I think this could be the year where they get over the hump and take a significant leap forward. Vegas doesn't see it that way. They have them at six and a half, but let's go through the schedule. Duquesne, that's a win. That's in week zero, by the way. So excited to have that one there at the end of August. LSU neutral site, going to be a tough game, but there's a lot of question marks about LSU this year. Who's their quarterback going to be? Is Brian Kelly going to be able to get things going year one? Florida State almost played Brian Kelly really close last year. Some people might think that Notre Dame last year had a better roster than LSU will have this year. I don't know if I agree with that, but I can see why people would make that argument. At Louisville, tough game. But here we go. Here's where you can maybe make some moves. Boston College at home, Will be a tough game. Jerkovic, they're going to run the football. They still have good personnel on the outside, on the perimeter offensively. The defense will be stout. Tim Lukabu does an amazing job on that side of the ball for Boston College, but I think that's a winnable game. Wake Forest got sideways last year. Could get sideways again, but I think the defensive line, which is what neutralizes what Wake Forest does offensively, they could put enough pressure on Wake Forest, and if Sam Hartman maybe throws him a ball or two and you can find a guy that can match up with A.T. Perry... Maybe you can keep that offense a little bit in check. Of course, you got to score. But either way, I think they match up better this year than they did a year ago. At NC State will be brutal. Clemson's at home. That'll be brutal. Georgia Tech should be a win. At Miami, at Syracuse, if you get a split there, should be in pretty good shape. And then you finish the season at home. Louisiana, I think they're going to be down this year. Now Billy Napier is at Florida. They're on the road in Tallahassee. I think the Doak will be rocking for that one, especially if a bowl berth is on the line or if something better than the bowl berth is on the line. I like Florida State on the over right here on six and a half. I think they're going to be really solid. I think they'll be really improved and they'll probably be a dangerous team that very few teams in the ACC want to play. All right, see, for those programs, the glass is half full, all right? So just stay optimistic, stay positive, and know that hope springs eternal because in August, everyone's undefeated. But we'll address that a little later when week zero rolls around. <laughs> look forward to talking about it. What I'm not looking forward to talking about is NIL regulations. It's not my thing. I don't like it. It's just not a fun conversation. Why? Because there's so many different things to disagree upon. Like, I don't necessarily care where this person stands or this person stands. Like, I have my own opinions, but ultimately, my opinions are going to tick half the people off and probably tick off the other half too because I kind of straddle the fence. When I look at this, Tommy Tupperville right now, he's a former football coach, of course, Texas Tech, Ole Miss, Auburn, you name it, Cincinnati. Uh, now he's a senator. And he is spearheading the latest congressional movement to regulate name, image, and likeness. Now, in an interview that he did with Ross Dellinger of Sports Illustrated, he talked about how he had an intent to draft a bipartisan NIL bill with Senator Joe Manchin, who's a Democrat from West Virginia. And 
But what I'm trying to figure out is there have been eight bills that have hit the floor in the last few years, none of which have gained any traction, including that of a bipartisan bill just a couple years ago that went nowhere. So why is this bill going to be different? Well, here's why we're talking about it right now, because Tommy Tuberville has talked to Nick Saban. He's talked to the commissioners of both the SEC and Greg Sankey and the commissioner of the Pac-12, George Klyovkov, trying to kind of gauge what they suggest and what they recommend to be included in the bill. Ultimately, here's where I stand. Nothing's going to happen in the near term. Until there's freedom of litigation, nothing is going to happen because the NCAA, they can't drop the hammer. The bipartisanship is going to go out the window the second they get into the details and the finer points of the bill itself. So are we talking about it because it's going to generate goodwill? Uh, I don't know, because I don't think it's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. We're going to continue to live in this world in which it feels like a free-for-all. And, and that's okay. Because ultimately, when toe meets leather on Saturdays throughout the fall, the game for those 60 minutes or those three hours or four hours, if you're in the Big 12 and you're throwing it all over the yard, <laughs> the game is going to be the game. And when I get up there and I'm standing in the booth, or if I'm sitting in the stands, or if I'm walking up to the stadium at a neutral site environment, I'm not thinking about what the left guard's going to make. I'm not thinking about what the right guard did in NIL and how he got to that specific school. I don't care. All I care about is the X's, the O's, the Jimmy's, and the Joe's, and the stories that go along with it. So just so you know, because we do do news and notes on this show, there's a bill, a bipartisan bill, being led by Tom, Tommy Tuberville and Joe Manchin of Alabama and West Virginia, respectively, a Republican and a Democrat, respectively. Maybe they come together. Maybe they find a resolution. But I wouldn't bet more than a penny on it. That's for sure. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. We appreciate you being with us. Please like, rate, and subscribe wherever it is you're consuming the content, whether that's on ESPN's YouTube channel, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, or if it's on Spotify, we really appreciate the interaction. It helps the show. It helps us. And we look forward to more conversations with you here in the near future. Hit us up in the comments. Hit us up via email at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. You can also follow us on social media, both Instagram and Twitter at alwayscfb. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.